Hi, and welcome to the Mobile Caddy webinar. Uh, thanks for everyone attending. This webinar is on the build and deploy of custom, robust, offline mobile apps with any JavaScript framework for the Salesforce platform. We've got quite a lot to cover today, so we're going to move at a pace. But uh, this video, uh, sorry, this uh, webinar will be recorded, and um, we'll make sure that that gets pushed out in the next couple of days. Just in the way of introductions, um, on the line today is myself, Justin, uh, CEO and co-founder, with Paul, our CTO and fellow co-founder, and Todd, uh, our mobile architect. What we're going to cover today is why we should use Mobile Caddy, a few slides on just the context around um, the use of Mobile Caddy. We're going to look at creating a mobile application. We're going to um, look at then coding that locally and set up our local development environment ready to code. We're going to then update our application. And finally, we're going to run that updated mobile app uh, and deploy. And then we'll hopefully have some time for some Q&As at the end. Um, so what is Mobile Caddy? If I can just uh, start with that. It's the foundation of your organization's mobile transformation. And what we mean is we're going to be concentrating on an element of Mobile Caddy today, the build element. But really, the idea is to ensure the uninterrupted delivery of critical business um, applications to all your mobile constituents, be they employees, partners, and customers. Um, and this means we need to rise to some new challenges. Um, primarily what to do when we are disconnected in a uh, very connected world, um, how we create new applications um, cost effectively today and uh, also easily enhance them uh, tomorrow and ongoing. And also in this new world to accept the loss of control, control of devices and users that we're used to, but uh, not to accept the loss of responsibility and just to keep delivering, delivering and delivering. So to help us uh, attack these problems, um, we have come up with a concept, Moore's Design, which is for business-critical mobile applications. And that can be thought of in five key components, really. Mobile first, offline first, robust, efficient, shared, and separated. And what we mean is, from a mobile first, we have every user as an expected mobile user to be any location, any, anywhere in the world, and to be running potentially multiple devices, uh, those devices running multiple OSs, and probably multiple form factors. But we assume an offline first scenario, so always the connection uh, is, is not available. And that means we would want application data always to interact with the local device store first, and then synchronize uh, when we can. And the also all required logic uh, the application code is stored and can run locally as well. From a robust perspective, um, there's lots of things going on when we go mobile and offline. Um, lots of combinations of connections, transmissions, different device failure potentials. So a real holistic approach is required. And that means really thinking about all these potential failure points and their roots. And then making sure we handle these gracefully, um, most importantly look without losing any data and also not to uh, interrupt the uh, user experience uh, on, on the application. We also mean by robust um, being able to keep enhancing the application uh, seamlessly from the platform side and the device side. And so a versioning engine is absolutely crucial. The ability to run different versions for different devices and different users and control and manage these uh, deployments. And then efficiency. With, uh, Every byte being sacred and carrying a cost, uh, really, really important. And that cost can be thought of both in monetary terms, the cost of the bandwidth itself, and also the cost of increasing failure. The more transmissions that we send, the larger those transmissions, then um, the data packets, uh, the increasing failure uh, becomes uh, a problem. So efficiency must be prioritized, but not at the cost of robustness. Um, and that means we want to ensure application data, as well as application configuration data, i.e. upgrades, are always reduced in size. And finally, um, shared separated. 
This is a new way of thinking, really, where we have offline first and robustness as key requirements. And that is that um, logic and functionality that's required to both run on the device and the platform needs to be shared in terms of its outcome, its logic outcome, uh, but needs to be separated uh, in the sense that it needs to run independently on the device and the platform. So where there's no connectivity, uh, that device can continue to function. So overall, well, we have this requirement to have a platform or a suite of tools to allow the organizations to deliver these more designed applications, um, but importantly, not introducing cost or increasing uh, development time or skills. And this is a real pressing requirement, and, um, and that really brings us into this requirement for uh, Mobile Caddy. And Mobile Caddy, although we're going to concentrate just in really the build process today, can be thought of as a full DevOps platform crossing the boundaries between development and operation, going through the build, test, deploy cycle, and then into the manage, monitor, and enhance, all centered around these Moore's designed applications. And we sum that up really by ensuring this continuous delivery and operation of these robust offline mobile apps. So we'll start to see how, um, in context, we're going to work today. So we have the platform, and we have our normal data users and our config data, and we say, well, we want to start to mobilize that data. We want to be able to synchronize that data, and we want to be able to push application packages to devices, and we want to make sure that all of that can work offline, our, our cache will work. And looking at that Moore's design, we want to be able to make sure that we can version that whole package, if you like, of items uh, through some provisioning process. And that, that process itself would be dependent on the user and their device uh, combination, the user provisioning. And then, of course, we want to um, make sure that all of that is working all of the time. So moving into the ops side, um, full monitoring engine, really. And finally, we do want to get these apps into the field. So we need some device apps. Uh, these are hybrid apps running on Android or iOS. Um, and those will need to authenticate into the platform. Uh, and they will exchange application data and application configuration data, which is our app versioning application packages. And then we would want to be able to, uh, from the build process, be able to emulate these devices simply we do that with a platform emulator, which we'll have a, a look at today. And that's a browser-based emulator, but really exchanging its data, application data, and its app versioning data in exactly the same way, except we're pre-authenticated, so no OAuth required. And then really the, uh, the majority of our talk today will be on the code flow side. This is our local development environment tool set, which creates our application package in our standard web technologies. And that itself does need to OAuth in, and that's to exchange its application package, the package we create, ready to then push that out to our device apps and our platform emulator. And we'll also see the use of uh, a code flow emulator, so really speeding up the local development, we can emulate the application using the local application package, but still OAuthing into the platform and still bringing down application data and application configuration data. Uh, from the platform. So we can move along now and have a look at what we're going to be building. We're going to create a mobile application on the platform from what we call a seed app. Um, this gives us a basic application and the building blocks to get us all moving nice and quickly. We're going to test our seed app in the platform emulator and make sure it's functioning as uh, we would like to see. Uh, we'll have a quick look at how we actually got the data to the application, how we mobilized it from the platform. Um, and after that, we're going to pass to Todd uh, to connect the code flow to this app, and then we can have a look at uh, running in our local code flow emulator. Um, just at this point, if there are any questions, um, I'll keep going through to the end of the Q&A, but uh, we'll stack them up in the chat window, so please post them uh, as, as you think of them. So just before I pass to Paul, uh, to actually um, mobilize and create this application. Let's have a look at the structure of the app very quickly. It's a very simple time and expense application. It's really centered around uh, a, a projects table, which can have um, a lookup to a location, um, and can have time or expense uh, single records um, added against it. Um, 
we're using version one of this seed app, which uses the Ionic framework as its UI components, uh, which we'll go into a little bit more later. Um, but if you want to have a dig around, there's a link there for you. Um, the basic UI uh, list of projects, we'll see that, and we can drill into a detailed view of a project and then simply add a time and expense. We also have a quick look at our bundled UI logic uh, settings area, which comes with the seed app, just to give you another head start, um, which gives us things like logout and debug tools, um, and that can be uh, retained or, or, or removed at your discretion. So uh, with that, I'm going to pass over to um, uh, Paul, um, who's going to mobilize and uh, create and mobilize our application. So, uh, Paul, over to you, if that's okay. Thank you, Justin. Yes, start enabling the screen share there, so we should all be able to see the screen. So, I've, I've logged in to um, Salesforce to an org where we have a mobile caddy installed. Um, you can see the application here, the Salesforce drop-down there, the mobile caddy application. A, a, a set of tabs, we're not going to go into all of them um, for this particular call. Uh, a few of importance. Um, that I'll, I'll quickly show now. If I go into this tab here, this is a, a, a tab called Mobile Applications. Now, within this uh, within, within this tab, we have a list of different um, mobile applications. These are applications defined on the platform, on the sales, Salesforce platform that our developers are, are currently working on. So we, we don't wish to um, to interfere or trip over what they're doing. So for this particular demo. I'll create a brand new Salesforce uh, a platform mobile application, a mobile caddy app. So without further ado, I'll go to the, the startup tab. And this is um this is our, our, our startup area. So um, what I can do at this particular point is create myself a brand new mobile application. So a couple of pieces of information um, that we need here. One of them is uh, is the name that the device um, will know our app by, the actual um, uh, the, the, the actual piece of code it sits on your on your Android or your iOS, iOS device, or indeed, as Todd will show us later on the code flow emulator. So, just give this a name. And then a mobile application is this something easy that, that that we will remember the app by. And um, what we see here are a list of documents. Um, uh, the, the actual seed application and um, the latest version is this one marked 005. These, um, these basically the whole mobile caddy backend application can be defined within a document. And to actually install it, I've just clicked the, um, the installation link. And, and what that's done is it's created me here a brand new um, application record. And together with that, all of the, um, we can see all of these related lists. It's given me all of that information as well, a simple click of a link. Um, so it's extremely useful if you've got a, a, a bare naked org and you wish to install an app. It's just done from a document. It gets us running right away. So what I'll do now is we, we can see the application name I gave this and the, the name at the top there, the device name. I'm not going to go into what all of this data does for this particular uh, call. I'll just look at a few important ones because I think everybody's going to want to see this run. Um, so I'm going to look at this thing called a provisioning record. Let's pop into the first one here. <clears throat> now, the, the provisioning record, it, it combines essentially three key pieces of information. Um, one of them is the, is the application, the user here, who is, uh, that's me, the person who's created this. It's given me a, a nice default provisioning record for myself to use. Um, and also, we've got the, the application details. So you can see here again the, the details that we've, uh, we've entered when we created our app. And then, and then this larger section here, which is actually the device information. So this, this particular um, provisioning record is, uh, happens to be for a, an Android device. Um, now, I'm not going to go into every single field here, but I will draw your attention to a couple which, which are important. You've got the, the viewport width and the viewport height. Now, that's the width and the height of my device, of the device that I typically use and what that enables me to do if I just scroll to the top we have three buttons here which kick off our what we call the mobile caddy platform emulator and I can run it in three modes the portrait and the landscape they show how the app would look on the device 
the, the debug button gives me a full screen view, which is excellent for debugging the app. It enables you to open, um, if you use uh, Google Chrome like myself or Firebug, something like that, it enables you to open a panel and do your, do your app debugging and so on. But I think without further ado, um, for this demo, I will click here on the portrait button so we can see this running. Now, this is actually running up the app as it would appear on my particular Android device, so it's, it's fully featured. Um, it's, it, it's the same code base it would run if it was on a device. No smoke and mirrors here. It's, uh, this, is, this is a fully featured app. I mean, I can click on a record here, and we can see, as Justin's explained earlier, we've got time and expense records uh, running, running away. Um, there's, there's an important area that I will show you down in the settings area, which is extremely useful for, for developers. Um, when you're again when you're debugging your app and, and of course I'm running here a mobile application which means that although you can see it here on our platform emulator this is completely 100% available when you're running on the device in the field so you'll be able to go into this area called the mobile table inspector and uh, if you look down here you can see a list of these are a list of all of the the, the, the tables the mobile tables as we call them that are running on the device. You can see some with the underscore underscore AP suffix. Um, we'll, we'll see shortly, but they basically come from Justin's design slide that we've just seen. Um, and we'll, we'll look very shortly at how they appear in Salesforce. Um, so you can, you can look at the list of tables, and when you're out in a field debugging your app, you can click on them, and you can then scroll through the records and see what's actually there in my, in my table. Very, very useful for debugging. Any, any people who are Salesforce uh, developers, uh, will, will Salesforce consultants in general will recognize there are some um, Salesforce IDs in there. So what, what I'm going to do at this point, I think, is show how um, this table that I'm looking at here, I happen to be looking at the time and expense, how that is uh, represented on the actual platform itself. So I'm, I'm back in my, uh, my, prov my provisioning record. And Justin's already mentioned the importance of versioning. I'm going to go to something called a dynamic version record here, part of our mobile caddy metadata. And I'm not going to explain all of this for this particular call. We're just going to look at the app data, the application data itself, as we're going to come on to, uh, to do some changes there. And if I scroll down to the bottom, we can see here those uh, particular mobile tables that Justin has already described. Together with the S objects they come from, if you remember these S objects were also on Justin's slide. Um, I can actually click in a, a further level um, into the actual time and expense definition. And if I scroll down to the bottom here, we can actually see all of the, uh, the fields that have been made available um, yeah, on, on, on the device. So I think later later on in this uh, in this call we're going to add one of those and see um, how we can add that and how it all works. But I think for the, this particular moment, um, we'll go back to you, um, Justin, for a, 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 a continuation walk through talking about the, the code flow. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Paul. Um, so what we've um, what we're going to do now is. Um, we're actually going to connect to our, uh, I've just got to switch uh, screens here, um, should have come through, there we go. Um, we're going to connect uh, our local environment to the new mobile application. Um, I'll have a quick look at the app package structure as we go forward. Um, we'll also then run the app up in a local code flow and emulator so we can see exactly how quick we can start to work with it. And then what we're going to do is we're going to simulate um, a change of business requirements so we can see a whole flow uh, in this sort of uh, quick 45 minutes um, where the business has decided that there needs to be a change to the application and then we'll, we'll sort of uh, take a very simplified version of that and uh, enhance the application in real time. This demo is all real time and we're working live on the platform. Um, and again, if you've got uh, any chats relating to that as we're covering a lot of area, please uh, pop, pop them into the uh, to the chat window. So I'm going to pass over to um, to Todd now, who's working uh, locally. Um, just uh, pop that over to you now, Todd. 
and we'll have a look at this uh, application uh, running locally. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Paul. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so what we're, we're going to do, as Justin said, is um, using uh, one of the mobile caddy seed applications um, that I've downloaded from the mobile caddy uh, GitHub repos. Um, I'm going to be running that up on a, a my local local server that started through the tools that are uh, provided with the package, um, and then what we're going to do is is, is run that up, and essentially we'll be um, seeing almost exactly what we saw uh, Paul run through in terms of the platform emulator. But this will be running off the JavaScript in our own machine here. I've got this uh, a link to it nicely here, and I can if I open that up and start my developer tools as well you should be able to see um, our app being built. Um, what's happening at the moment is uh, the JavaScript is talking, um, is our all thing into the platform. It's requesting information about the application um, that Paul's just built. This is using the very same app. Um, and it's, it's brought down all the metadata that describes the application, um, as well as the tables that um, are provided for the application. So things in this case like uh, a list of projects, a uh, list of time and expense records, etc. What the code flow also gives us is a, um, a mock for the encrypted smart store that's provided um, by Salesforce for use on the devices, um, so for Android and iOS. Um, and what we have is a, a version here that, that um, uses HTML5's local storage. So we've got full transparency when looking at the uh, details within our records. Um, this includes the system records as well as our tables. Um, for, for example, I've got our, our projects listing here that I could, I could dig into if I wanted to. What I want to show you here now is a, a quick example of the app running locally. Uh, again, this has pulled all the data from Salesforce in real time. Um, I can run into this project. We can see that it's got a, a title, some description. Um, I can also see if there's any uh, time and expense records for this particular project and there is just a couple here. Um, we can jump back and have a look at the expense records as well. And there they are. Um, as you can see I've got all my console logging on. This is in debug mode. Um, and what we can also do is we can jump back to um, the same debug tools that, that Paul was showing us on the platform in here. Um, and hopefully you'll see that it looks it looks identical and that's because we're actually running the same, the same, very same code, um, except mine's running on my local machine, and we can dig in. These tools that are provided make it um, make it very easy to debug. Um, if you've got, uh, I don't know, objects coming down in, in, in data types you weren't expecting, etc., makes it makes it very simple. I think then, uh, just is it right that you, you might have a new business requirement for Paul? Yeah, that's exactly right. So we'll we'll pick up there, which is great. So we, what we've really done now is we've seen you know a creation of a mobile application from the platform very very quickly using a seed app, and there's uh, 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 shell apps as well, which don't have so much uh, already written, but but give you a good start. And then we passed over, linked that to our code flow, and we've now got this app. We're assuming in the field running, and the business is saying to us, well, look, when we put a new expense in. Um, what we've got, as Todd's just showing us now, um, we can have a description and, a, and, a, and a, a, a question about how much the actual expense was. And now we're being asked we'd like to have an expense type uh, put in there. So a small enhancement, but hopefully give us a, a feel. So the first thing we would do is we would uh, create that field if it's not already created on the platform. And then we want to mobilize that. Um, and then we want to actually uh, bring that back into the code flow side of things and, and build that field into the UI and the logic. So I'm going to pass to Paul now, who's going to uh, show us how we actually uh, mobilize a new field. And this is very, very similar for mobilizing a new object as well. Just for the uh, sake of brevity uh, for the webinar, we're just going to do a field. But um, Paul, over to you, if we can. Oh, Thanks, Justin. Um, what I'm going to do now is, uh, first of all, before adding the field, I'm just going to check to make sure I'm allowed to. So I've come back to my provisioning record, um, and we've already been up to the uh, the versioning area here, the dynamic version. Now, uh, the first thing I'm going to do before just going ahead and, and, and adding 
for mobilizing a field is check here I've got a status which is in developing. Um, if I was further up the life cycle, like it was a deployed app, for example, then I wouldn't be allowed. Mobile Caddy would stop me making these kinds of changes. However, fortunately, at this point I'm allowed to. So I'll go back up to the area we were in before, um, revisit my uh, time and expense uh, object here with a list of all those, there's 23 there, mobilized, um, uh, mobilized fields. And what I'll do is I'll run this wizard here at the table columns wizard. And this, this, this basically runs up a list of all of the, um, the, non, the, uh, not the fields that are not yet mobilized at the top, and there's confirmation at the bottom there of those that already have been. So Justin has asked me to, uh, to make available the expense type for Todd to use um, you know, on, the, on the mobile side, on the mobile um, side of, the, the, of mobile caddy. So you can use that in the code flow and obviously on the device. Um, now, what I have to do here is um, I have to actually give Todd permission. I can't just mobilize the field. We have a, a set of CRUD records here. So we, I can actually say, well, Todd is actually going to be creating data with this, uh, using this field. He's also going to be reading from the field updating and I'll give him the full access for the purpose of this demo. Um, as we can see there's another setting here, conflict setting. Conflict is very important if you've uh, got a set of records on the device and a, a set of records in Salesforce and, and people are editing both sets of records potentially. What happens when the device comes online and attempts to do a synchronization? Well in mobile caddy we've got um, various, I won't go into the detail of it, but you've got various options. I'm going to pick most straightforward for us, which is we use the latest system mod stamp. So basically, basically the, uh, the, the latest record wins. I'll click create table rows. That returns me to my app data. And as we can see, we've now got 24, so 23. And if I go in there, we can see that the expense type has been added at the, uh, the bottom of the list there. And and basically, this, this field is now fully available for, um, for Todd uh, to use on the, on the mobile device. Um, so at this, uh, at this particular point, would, um, would you like me, uh, Justin, to show that here on, the, on, on our platform emulator, or should we go straight to Todd? I think if you've got a second there, Paul, if you can just run the, uh, the emulator up again, which would be sort of standard fare now to just make sure the changes that you've made to the tables that you want to mobilize or the extra tables um, are actually coming through. So this is where the, uh, the uh, platform emulator comes in really handy. So here we are. I've run up the, um, the good old platform emulator. I'll go back as before into CR Mobile Table Inspector. And we'll look at the, uh, the time and expense records. And as we can see, if I scroll down here, the expense type field is now here in my smart store on the device, in my, and, uh, running sweetly. No need for anybody to, to change or write any code um, to, to put that into the, the smart store, or into the sync algorithms and so on. It's now there fully available for Todd to use. Great, thanks, thanks, Paul. Um, so with that, we'll have a look at what we're going to do uh, with 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 that field now that's been uh, mobilised. Um, so what we've uh, what we've basically what we've got now is some new metadata to work with. So Todd, I'll I'll let you uh, talk through these slides on on what you're about to uh, to show everyone now on on the uh, CodeFlow side. Sure, thank you, Justin. Uh, yeah, as as you can see. Um, the various steps we're going to take now. We, we want to check that our new metadata is, is available to us so that we're receiving it uh, from the platform successfully. Once we've got that, um, the instructions we've got for our new requirement is um, to allow users in the field to use this expense type um, field when they create a new expense and pass that up. So we're going to uh, modify one of our templates to include an input box for that. Uh, and then we'll be updating our, Java, our JavaScript to pass that value through. Um, um, we're then going to run the app up with these changes made um, and create a new expense and, and, and see that sort of fly through. 
to the platform. Um, the final step um, in a real life cycle would be to, to pass the package up to the platform um, and we'll be doing that as well. So if I'm going to be making some changes, I can quickly talk you through the typical app structure. Um, so this is the, the app structure we've got in this particular seed application, which is based upon the Ionic framework, uh, which itself is um, sort of an extension to Angular. Um, although if you're using um, any other JavaScript framework, really, you be sort of familiar with this structure, it would be very similar. The top half here highlighted is essentially our project's uh, configuration and dependency um, tooling. Uh, so we've got, uh, we're using Bower in this particular instance to manage our dependencies. Uh, this is the Ionic and Angular libraries, as well as the mobile Cadi SDK libraries, so you can upversion those um, in a control fashion. Uh, we have Grunt for our um, task runner, this does um, sort of SAS processing, JS hinting, etc. Um, and we've also noted there's a test directory here. This allows us to um, configure .json files which can mock the platform um, so we can develop in a truly offline um, state um, which allows us to um, really show that um, failure cases can be, can be pushed through our testing. And in the WW directory, um, it's very, very sort of standard application setup. Um, we've got a JS file, that's where our core app is going to be living. Uh, the lib directory here will be for the third party JavaScript um, and the mobile code libraries um, and our templates area. So I'll be I'll be jogging into these uh, these directories here now. Right. Uh, as we said, this is an Ionic application which is uh, based off the kind of standard model view of controller setup, and you'd be very familiar with that if you're using an um, Angular before or Ember or um, any of those types of uh, frameworks. Uh, this is a, a brief kind of outlay of it here. Um, the one change to the, to the or, or kind of piece to mention for the mobile caddy app is that um, our data here will be coming through the mobile caddy SDK. Um, that's where we'll be doing our cloud operations. Right, let's, I think we should get on and code this then just. Okay, hopefully you can uh, see my screen again. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reload this local URL um, with a scrub true parameter. This will uh, basically uh, wipe all of my, uh, my local storage, which it has done. And so my app is now running up again as if it were the first install. So I'm bringing down all of the project metadata once more. Um, and we should see that this includes the new field that Paul has mobilized for us. So the first thing to check will be that uh, that table is available for us. Just going to uh, jump in into the uh, mobile table inspector. Uh, this is where Paul went to check that the field was available. And it was the expense type, I believe, in our MC time and expense table. Now we're looking there. I should be able to uh, scroll down and hopefully see that. And there it is. Excellent. So we have our, our metadata available. What we can do now is uh, modify our template and code to, um, to let our users see this. Uh, so I'm using Sublime in this case on, on a Mac, but you could really be using this in any, any IDE, really, in um, any, uh, any OS. I've got some, being a bit lazy, I've got some code I've written before for this. Uh, and I'll explain what I've, what I've just done. So this is a template file which is for um, handling the new expense records. In fact, it handles new times and expenses. Um, there's an, an Angular directive here, ng-switch, um, which means we can write the code in here for both time and expense. I'm going to be writing about the expense part, so I've thrown my new code into this block here. Um, and we've got input for the description. Um, how much it was, and now I've got my new expense type. So this is the chunk of code I've just, just pasted in. I'll save that. Um, what we now need to do is to modify our JavaScript. Um, in this case, I'm going to be changing uh, one of our controllers. 
to make use of that new value that will be coming through in the, uh, in the form field. And what we want to do is pass that into um, pass it into our code. Um, again, I've got some uh, copy and pasted code. Um, so this is a function block for our form submission. And what, I'm, what I've got is a, uh, an object here, which is our new expense. And I now have this, um, this attribute available for me, and I'm assigning that to the, uh, the value that came from the form field. What we can see um, when I save that is over here, our task runner is being kicked off. We've got a watch on these particular files, um, and it's doing some uh, JS hinting for me, which means it'll pick up any syntax errors and things like that, uh, and save me a lot of time. It's also creating my, uh, my resource for the package. What I can quickly do while I'm in here as well is show you how we um, how we actually interact with the mobile Caddy SDK and how our data is available um, offline as well as um, on the platform. In this, this is our services JavaScript file, um, and this particular area is where we're sending our new expense into. And use our function, um, and what mobile Caddy does. It provides me with a set of um, a set of module function calls um, that I can interact with. I interact with. And what I'm doing here is I'm saying, "Can you insert this record for me in this table?" And here's my record. We're using JavaScript promises, uh, which makes it nice and uh, nice and easy to write readable code and maintainable code. Um, and what I'm doing once this returns, um, I'm also going to ask for that table to be synced for me. Um, which means it's going to be attempted to be sent back to the platform if it's necessary. This can be done programmatically or, or through other means. Right, I think it's probably worth um, showing off uh, our, our new code then. So if I if I go back, um, I don't think I need to um, I need to scrub uh, the table anymore because uh, we're not having to download any new metadata. Um, what I do want to do is to, to reload all my JavaScript and my CSS and things. Hopefully, see my application running up now. And what I can do, let's let's click on this this project here uh, and jump into our, our new expense. And here is our new field that we just added. Uh, what did I spend money on? Um, Go to meeting license. Oh, I can't spell license. Is it like that? Uh, how much was it? So it's a hundred. Expense type. Uh, okay. SAS. Is it? Yeah. Uh, what I do now is when I click submit, this will call our controller, which you can see at the record locally into our um, into our local version of the smart store, so our mock smart store, um, and then I'll be asking for it to sync with the platform as well. You see that's returned back straight away. Um, and if I go into now to view my expense records for this project, I can see here that my expense is in here. And in fact, this, this last item in the row, yeah, that's actually uh, an attribute that's come back from the platform following the sync. And there's just, I believe we have um, a, a slide on how we interact with um, the mobile Kali libraries um, for the smart store and also the platform interactions uh, from a developer's point of view. Yeah, definitely. It's a, a simplified slide. So in, in, in a second, we're going to pass back uh, to Paul and have a look at what's actually happened in terms of the platform and the, the records uh, or the record that uh, Todd has just saved for us. Um, but what we're really seeing is a very high level is that the application as Todd shows us from the services uh, JS there, uh, calls uh, either CRUD operations or, or sync operation. In this case, we uh, did both an insert and immediately called a sync. But we can see on the side here, we've got various sync options. And uh, the last one being dev specified, you can sort of make that as complicated as you like. But the crucial thing here is that the, um, the CRUD operations, that's the inserts, the updates, the reads, uh, always interact with the local encrypted smart store first. Um, so from a user uh, experience perspective, uh, whether we're offline uh, or, or, or patchy connection, that's always going to maintain a good state for the user. And then we can decide um, via the requirements of the application when we would want to uh, synchronize. And so if you're on a, 
Wi-Fi only device, it may be not until you hit Wi-Fi, so that's contextual, it may be pulled down for user interaction, or it could even be timed, um, and that's per mobile table. So what we want to see is, is in this case, we did a, a, a from the insert and the media uh, synchronization back to the platform. When we hit the platform, um, that's not the end of the story. We do lots of uh, failure testing and um, conflict testing, as Paul was showing us uh, before. We've chosen a, a simplified um, record. So we'll have a look at that on the platform, but it can get um, can handle uh, much much more complicated batches and so on. But uh, for the sake of the demo, I'm going to pass back over to you, Paul, if we can have a look at um, what's actually happened on the platform. Absolutely. Yes, we'll do that. Thank you very much, Justin. So, and thank you, Todd. So, um, I'm back in the, the platform side of Mobile Caddy, and, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll we'll, we'll run this, run up this other tab. We've not been in here yet, called um, Connection Sessions. Um, now, what what these um, what these connection sessions actually do is they they basically represent an interaction between the uh, the mobile device um, and and the back end, the Salesforce back end. So. And we, we can monitor and see what's going on. If somebody goes into a tunnel and the records uh, come up but not been received back and there's a, a little issue there potentially, we can find out what's going on here and potentially retry as well. So um, there's a whole, whole list as we can see. If I go into um, to get the latest view, we can, we can see that, um, that, that Todd has been extremely busy on the platform. Um, what I've done here is I've created myself a, a, a Salesforce view so I can focus down on the time and expense, which is what uh, what Todd was working on there. And we can see here that um, in, in has come a, a, an update, a synchronization update. I'll go in and have a look at the record. A lot of, a lot of interesting information in there. We won't go into all of the detail at the moment. But what I will do is I'll, I'll click on this, uh, this button to view the, the synchronization results. And as you can see, what, what this tells us is that for this particular connection session, we had a single record because Todd only inserted a single um, time expense record. In it came, no failures of any type, any kind. Now, I, can, I can even go, I've got a, I'll open this here in a separate tab. I've even got a, a, the Salesforce ID of the record that was created. So. You remember from Justin's uh, di diagram earlier, we're, we're actually time and expenses recorded in object 002, and this is actually the record that came up. We can see owner is Todd, and uh, that's the record that came up from from the device itself. So a lot more information available, and again, I'm just going to just going to just a real general touch on it. Um, this is a log record. There's a a great deal of logging and monitoring that goes on within mobile caddy so much in fact is really the subject of a of a future a future webinar um, so what well, without ado I'll, let, I'll I'll pass back to you Justin thanks Paul yeah it's worth uh, noting at this point that all of this data is pre-configured and you don't need to dip in uh, at the level we have done now unless you have a problem um, or there's there's an issue uh, platform side, but that's the purpose of mobile caddy is to resolve those issues without your worries. So if there is a failure, as Paul was saying, going through a tunnel, um, and the uh, transmission may or may not have been completed, uh, mobile caddy and uh, the libraries on the device side, as well as the um, the uh, code on the platform side, will look after all of that, uh, and that will run seamlessly both from the platform perspective as well as the device perspective. Um, I've just had confirmation from Todd actually that the package that we've just uh, altered locally has been uploaded to the platform. What that means, uh, we've got a, another section again just for sake of webinar, uh, we've done that in the background, but we've upgraded the application package now that, that uh, Paul was running previously uh, through the provisioning record. So I wonder if you could just run up the uh, newer version now that's been uploaded, uh, Paul, and we can see if now we have these changes available for us uh, to run in the platform emulator. Okay, excellent. Excellent. Very quick work. So, okay, I'm here. Um, I've come back to the, the initial mobile application record that you remember was created right at the very start of the, uh, the process. Um, we'll, 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 uh, we'll actually go in and, uh, and run up, run up the, uh, the emulator again. Um, I'll just go back into my provisioning record and we'll, we'll see these changes. So, um, let's, uh, let's run this up in full screen so everybody can see it. 
applications being built. Just loading up the data now. Okay, so what I'll do now is I'll just um, I'll pick a I'll pick a record. And we'll go in and we'll have a look at the new expense screen. And hey, presto, yes, Todd's. Thank you for that, Todd. The the, the new requirements already been met. Um, so I'll put in. data here and we'll submit that there we go so a fully fully functional fully working application and it'll be interesting to see if, um, if I just go back to the connection sessions and we should now see some more interaction obviously uh, against myself um, and indeed there we are we can see that I've been uh, running the app um, we can actually see here, if I go into this particular record, we can see that the record that I've just sent up has been successfully inserted. Um, and I can even look at the Salesforce record again, repeating a little bit of what we've, we've done earlier, but proving it, it works also in exactly the same way from the platform emulator. Now, thank you, Justin, for the requirement and Todd for uh, implementing that so rapidly. Well done. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Paul, just one talk. Could you just switch? back to the connection sessions uh, tab with the all view um, what's interesting now is what would happen uh, beyond we would now use the provisioning record to actually uh, send this new version to maybe a specific user on our sandbox uh, to their device app and we do that by um, changing their dynamic version and all that's uh, seamless so an upgrade and we can see down the connection sessions there you see a record that sells us a new install uh, if we were versioning, we'd see a new version. What that means from a control perspective is we know uh, which user and a device combination is working on which version, um, how that is actually progressing through, and when everyone's onto our new version, or potentially we're running multiple versions, potentially for um, different devices, different form factors. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, come back over to the to the slides and. In a second, there we go, and um, we're going to summarise really what we've what we've achieved in a, in a very quick uh, amount of time. I think we're a couple of minutes over, so 45 minutes. But um, we've created a, a new app from the Mobile Caddy C. That happens to be Ionic, but it could be any uh, framework that you wanted to swap out. The uh, Mobile Caddy libraries, the SDK, is uh, framework agnostic, uh, as you've seen with uh, Todd's call there. They could have been in any framework. Um, we then connected uh, our local development environment, what we call CodeFlow, uh, ready to code. We've taken a simulated uh, requirement of an extra field and that added that uh, via the platform, as you see, very simple point and click. And we decided some very basic uh, conflict log uh, logic that would run for us. Um, and that's at the field level, although it's uh, using the system record mod stamp in Paul's case. Uh, that's at each field, so uh, field by field conflict. Uh, resolution and we then switched back to Todd and had a look at adding that field to the UI now using Ionic um, for those sort of Ionic um, standard components for inputs and so on you can see very very simple but you could make that UI uh, have a charting engine in there or, or whatever you'd like um, and then from the local side we then ran up our CodeFlow emulator just to ensure that we, we didn't need to do any debugging and then, although behind the covers there, while we were looking at the other side on the platform, we then deployed that final application package to the platform and got that ready um, to deploy on the devices. Um, something we didn't look at today is how the data actually gets to the device in the sense of what records are chosen. Again, that uh, is very, very simple, uh, point and click, uh, and can be extended via Apex uh, if we need to through Extensible. So Mobile Caddy is all about being simple in the first outs, uh, the first time you run up and, and potentially for, for most uses. Uh, it's then highly configurable uh, and it's extensible if we want to take um, some of those uh, pieces of logic that we've already got and then enhance them. So I think um, to wrap up, we've seen this mobile application that now we could run on a device uh, using our device app, so no code uh, to, to be written there uh, very, very quickly. And in fact, um, you know, in two to three hours using the Shell app, which is everything uh, in the setting side, but nothing in terms of any standard uh, tables such as the time expense or the projects, you can really get flying uh, out the gates uh, very, very quickly.
So we're going to move over to the uh, Q and A's. Um, I think we have a couple of questions. I've just got to open up the uh, the question panel. Um, let's just have a quick look at the uh, chat panel. Um, here we go. Okay, I'm going to field a couple of these myself. I think this one here, but I, I have one um, to summarise the question. Sorry, I'm paraphrasing a little bit here. Um, but we've got, got a question. So what, what are the skills, uh, I think this is the question, what are the skills required from the, the development side? Um, Todd, I, I sort of know the answer, but I'd like you to, to answer that on the, on the code flow side. Um, if you could just summarize uh, the skill set that you would expect a, a developer to have to get these, these mobile apps, uh, offline mobile apps out in the field. Sure, yeah, no problem. Um, so from the, the code flow side, it was um, all web dev technologies. Um, so it was JavaScript, um, HTML, um, and CSS. Uh, really, you could be using a, a framework if you're already familiar with something like Ember or Backbone. Or you could write it in, in vanilla JavaScript, really. Um, and from the platform side, um, uh, any kind of Apex familiarity would, would definitely be beneficial, but it, um, I'm not sure it would, it would hold you back, back too much. No, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. I think, you know, um, as, as, as you come from um, looking at the uh, flow that we use today, you can see that those web skills are, are the predominant, but as we said, there's a, a possibility you want to extend some of the functionality on the platform, um, and we allow hooks in uh, through interfaces uh, for that, and um, we can fill those questions uh, offline um, as they get a bit more technical. Um, got a question that asks about how many objects that can be mobilized. I think, uh, Paul, I'll pass that to you, and I, I would imagine we're probably talking about the number of tables. Uh, we, we, our terminology is tables, and maybe you could explain that a, a bit more, Paul, for us. Absolutely. Thank you. That's a good question. So you don't have any, there aren't any real um, restrictions as such. I mean, you can, you can use the, the app to mobilize as, as many tables as you, you want, but whether or not that's a, let's be honest, if, if that's a sensible approach, I, I wouldn't think so. I mean, generally, um, mobile app development, we found it, you know, over the years, we need to try and restrict as much as possible the, 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 the data, you know, try and make the records narrow, the, the, the objects well designed, so that you're not heaving huge chunks of information onto the device when, when, when it starts up initially. Um, and of course, you're not going to put loads of um, blow data down there that you don't actually need. So no restrictions, but um, best practice would be to, you know, to, to keep things lean. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that, and I think that you could take that, um, that, that whole philosophy if you look at the Moore's design concept and apply that to the application data uh, in terms of the, 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 the tables and the fields, but the actual data itself, um, you can apply that to, which is why we have dynamic versioning, so that we're not sending down these massive Xs all the time. It's really a whole concept to look at uh, when you go offline, as, as offline first, is really to think about the design of the application uh, before any coding is done and see where for instance, with Salesforce, with the cross-object formulas, we can remove tables if we're just referencing one field that could actually be pulled through very simply by the by the platform. Again, I think we're probably wandering into uh, a, a more functional question, but it's, it's really interesting from a development perspective of what you would want to see. And actually, looking at the connection sessions uh, in a little bit more depth in another webinar, you can start to see the time taken for various transfers in terms of transmissions the sizes of the records that are coming up and down, and you can start to make uh, decisions early on. And with the versioning engine, of course, if you do get it wrong or you start to hit some maximums, um, it's very easy then to change that configuration and then push out uh, a newer version uh, that maybe is uh, more efficient in terms of uh, maybe the, uh, the app data. And when Paul was talking about the dynamic version being locked down for development, that's the same as the app data, which is also versioned uh, and can then be changed, fields removed, added, and so on and so forth. Um, I've got a, a last question. I think, uh, Todd, you did cover very uh, quickly um, when you went running up your code flow. Um, but the code flow itself, is, is that specific to, to, to the Mac uh, that you're running on? Could you just um, elaborate a little bit on the OSs that you can use uh, for, from the code flow side? Uh, yeah, sure. Um Again, everything is is using kind of open 
open tools um, and uh, and kind of software approaches where, where we can. Um, and in this instance, um, the code flow will run up just as fine on a on a Windows machine or, or Linux machine as well as the Mac. Yeah, we're trying to um, trying to cover as many bases as possible. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think then we're coming to the end of the questions. Um, if there's any more questions for us, um, there is one that I did touch on actually. That's uh, I, I should have really brought up a, a bit further in the um, uh, initial uh, graphic there, which is on the device apps. Um, the device apps again, really, we're such a broad tool that uh, we can't afford to cover everything in this webinar. But um, the two device apps or the two OSs that you can run devices on are, are Android and uh, iOS at, at this point. Um, to use those, we will we will hold a, a further webinar to show those. But basically, they're installed from either the, the Play or the App Store. Um, and from a user's perspective, the login uh, using OAuth, um, using the Salesforce, basically the SDK, the, the mobile SDK. Below that, we will get the normal authentication requirements, uh, so the normal user name and password, and then that's it. The app will build itself, as we saw, um, only once when the app is installed, will build itself out and then your users away. And we would see that through the connection sessions. And then if we were to version, uh, and let's say we version the app data as we see, um, we, we saw with the requirement there, only the application data itself would be reconfigured, in other words, re-downloaded for that particular table right down to the granular level. So that efficiency, again, is driven through even, even the versioning. Um, so from a developer's perspective, it's nice because we can iterate very, very quickly. From the ops side, the deployment side, uh, we can monitor those deployments and uh, put them down to sort of profiles. So a certain profile could receive this version to start with and then and then roll out globally if, 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 that, was, if that was seen as a, as, as a good testing uh, structure. Uh, really whatever suits the organization. Um, so with that, I've put our contact details up here. Please feel free to contact us um, directly. Uh, I'll also move to the last slide of the deck there, which is um, all our channels to, uh, to, to monitor if you're interested in particularly offline. Uh, but really, we're, we're a robust uh, a tool that covers a lot more than offline. Um, our developer site is developer.mobilecaddy.net please um, take a look around the documentation is flowing in there uh, slowly we also have the YouTube channel which is uh, worth seeing with a link on there and with that really it just leaves me to say uh, uh, thanks to uh, Todd and Paul for their time today um, really, really good demo and thank everyone who's attended and uh, especially uh, who asked questions that uh, maybe next time I'll put in the webinar so really, really appreciate it and uh, thanks very much for all your time